The privileged world of naval aviation is enjoyed by only a few of the United States elite fighter pilots. Unlike the Air Force or Army pilots who can consider their land-based airstrips as home, a naval aviator's home is the open seas. Comforting visits by friends and relatives are almost unheard of, and the sacrifices don't stop there. A great deal of potential danger is also ever-present when working on a carrier steel deck. However, the special rewards of flying for the Navy more than make up for these hardships. Naval aviation is now part of an American seagoing tradition, and the aircraft carrier is where it starts. To protect its fleets from airborne attacks, the U.S. Navy issued a request for a dedicated and uncompromised jet fighter. At first, the Navy's lengthy list of requirements seemed impossible to meet. But after years of research, inspiration, and plain hard work by the Grumman Aerospace Corporation, American Ingenuity created the Tomcat, or F-14, as it is officially known. Two squadrons of Tomcat fighters are deployed on the major carriers for missions around the world. The F-14 is so complex and demanding that two aviators are needed to fly it. The pilot's concentration is focused full-time on his flight controls, and the flight officer understands the unique electronics of the Tomcat's radar and weapon systems. Like any good team, the aviators rapport with their Tomcat's maintenance personnel, ordnance specialists, and deck crew is crucial. Each man's role is equally important as the F-14 excels where lesser aircraft have tried but failed in the role of MiG killer. The steam-powered catapult hurls the F-14 into the heavy sea air. The Tomcat's wings are swept forward for maximum lift as it hungers for the freedom that only higher altitudes can provide. Within moments, the F-14 will be slicing through the skies at Mach 2.3. Although beautiful to behold, the F-14 is foremost an amazing engineering achievement. The Navy determined that both high and low speed combat maneuverability were to be equally important for its new fighter, as were the aircraft's top speed and patrol range. To satisfy these contradicting requirements, Grumman engineers designed a computer-controlled variable sweep wing. The Navy also wanted the F-14 to be reliable, resist corrosion, and be able to fit on existing carriers. To meet these goals, the F-14 is constructed with aluminum alloys, titanium, and for the first time, composite materials used for key load bearing structures. The heart of the Tomcat is its AIM-54 Phoenix weapon system, easily the most advanced air-to-air -air missile to date. The six Phoenixes carried by the F-14 can destroy enemy airborne targets up to 90 miles away. In fact, the F-14 itself was specially designed for the Phoenix weapon system, and after nearly 20 years, the Tomcat is still the only fighter built to launch it. None of these accomplishments would have been possible without the lessons learned from the Vietnam War. 
Carrier Task Force 77 began bombing North Vietnam in February 1965. President Johnson hoped the selective destruction of military targets would convince the communist government that a war against the United States would be futile. Nevertheless, the North Vietnamese endured attacks launched from carriers until the war's end. The staging area in the Gulf of Tonkin for the airstrikes was known as Yankee Station. The first retaliatory strikes were codenamed Flaming Dart. The aviators were carefully briefed on a day's selected targets. They were specifically ordered to avoid damaging any civilian or certain industrial facilities. Operation Rolling Thunder would soon follow. The aviators flew dedicated attack aircraft such as the A-1 Sky Raider and A-4 Skyhawk. A-1s and A-4s were low-speed, low-altitude specialists which could drop ordnance from under thick cloud cover. This was very useful as poor weather frequently prevented other aircraft from even launching. The USS Midway, her crew and aircraft spent 144 days on the line in 1965. The piston-powered Douglas Sky Raider was a brawny war horse left over from the last days of World War II. Although obsolete at the time of its deployment to Yankee Station, the A-1's endurance and heavy payload were very valuable when pinpoint attacks were most needed. Flying the beast took muscle. Strafing and bombing were its chief callings. The Skyhawk was Douglas's jet-powered light attack platform developed in the 1950s. No other aircraft flew as many sorties over North Vietnam during Rolling Thunder, as did the legendary A-4. The Marines also flew the A-4 from Da Nang and Chu Lai. The Skyhawk was heavily armed with two 20-millimeter cannons, air-to-ground rockets and guided missiles, and of course, bombs. The A-4 did its job so well that it was one of the few aircraft to serve during the entire eight years at Yankee Station. Maintenance crews praised its reliability, and aviators loved its easy handling. No bomber was ever this light and so lethal. Vietnamese airfields were politically off-limits to strikes, but when the ban was temporarily lifted, Skyhawks gave their all to destroy the North Vietnamese Air Force. The communist inventory was small, but often very effective in preventing our air superiority. One of the aircraft flown by the North Vietnamese was the Soviet-designed Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-17 Fresco. 
developed from the MiG-15, which flew during the Korean War. The MiG-17 was armed with 23mm cannons and had superb low-altitude maneuverability. Combined with MiG-19 farmers, these MiGs could be very lethal against heavily laden A-1 and A-4 strike aircraft. North Vietnam had a powerful network of Soviet-designed air defenses. MiGs, surface-to-air missiles, and anti-aircraft artillery would each claim many aerial victims. The phrase, feet wet, would be two of the happiest words a pilot could speak as he flew across the beach toward his carrier home. The mission completed. The A-4 bomber paid a price for having flown the Navy's most sorties. Nearly 200 Skyhawks were lost in combat. More than 70 additional A-4s were lost in operational accidents. All told, the A-4 losses represented almost one-third of the Navy's total aircraft and helicopter losses during the Vietnam War. Many Skyhawks proved their ability to take a hit by bringing their pilot back home so they could barely fly or recover on deck. Cannons were the A-1s and A-4s only air-to-air -air weapons. Using cannons exclusively was both difficult and dangerous. The Vietnam War became the first opportunity to deploy in combat the guided air-to-air -air or air interception missile. After the retirement of the F-8 Crusader, the F-4 Phantom II would be the Navy's primary fighter. Medium-range Sparrow missiles used radar to detect and track their MiG targets. Short-range, heat-seeking Sidewinder missiles had an acquisition system which homed in on the MiG's infrared emissions. Both missiles were carried by F-4s for maximum dogfighting versatility. Two aviators manned the F-4's controls, just like today's F-14. Phantom was the most versatile jet fighter in the U.S. inventory. The Marines and the Air Force flew it for ground attacks as well. The F-4 would quickly reign as each service's leading MiG killer. The MiGs, however, had other ideas in mind. The North Vietnamese Air Force received the more sophisticated MiG-21 fish bed from the Soviets in 1966. The supersonic MiG-21s were better armed than the MiG-17s as they carried two Atoll air interception missiles in addition to their cannon armament. The heat-seeking Atoll missile was almost an exact copy of the Navy's Sidewinder. Directed by ground radar controllers, MiG-21s would join forces with MiG-17s attempting to deny F-4s both high and low altitude airspace. Although smaller and slightly slower than the F-4, the MiG-21 was more maneuverable and a highly capable combat aircraft. North Vietnam put its best pilots at the controls.
The Navy and Marines lost 16 aircraft to MiG fighters. The Air Force lost 63. Colonel Toon was the North's leading ace with 13 claimed kills. Captain Nguyen Van Bay claimed seven kills and the honor of being the first ace of the Vietnam War. A high percentage of American prisoners of war were pilots who had been shot down over North Vietnam. Refused access to the Red Cross, the North Vietnamese treated the airmen as criminals and subjected them to beatings and ritual torture. Many died from starvation and disease. Perhaps the greatest day in modern U.S. naval aviation is 10 May 1972, as Lieutenants Randy Cunningham and William Driscoll shot down three MiG fighters during one mission. With Colonel Toon as their last kill, Cunningham and Driscoll became the world's first missile aces. The F-4s were successful against the MiG-21s, but were not as overwhelming as American fighters were against the MiG-15 during the Korean War. The lethality of the weapons carried by Navy aircraft was made painfully evident on 29 July, 1967. After only five days on the line in the Gulf of Tonkin, the USS Forrestal suffered a terrible disaster when air-to-ground rockets were accidentally ignited. Their explosion resulted in a catastrophic fire, which raged uncontrollably across the forest all's deck. 21 F-4s, A-4s, and RA-5s were destroyed. After containing the fire and assessing the damage, the forest all was to immediately return to its Norfolk, Virginia port for lengthy repairs. Its time on the line at Yankee Station was over for the remainder of the war. A smaller accident had occurred on the USS Oriskany just months earlier when a flare locker exploded, destroying three aircraft. These accidents proved that duty on the carrier's deck can be as dangerous as duty in the skies. The losses to personnel on the forest all were tragically high. 134 men were killed and at least 62 injured. The Oriskany suffered the loss of 44 men and 38 injured. Although infrequent occurrences, these accidents remind us of the heavy price paid by those sailors who will never enjoy the aviator's glory of being a MiG killer, but nonetheless risk all for the service of their country. Air Force fighter loss to kill ratios were two to three. The Navy was far more successful, partly due to their top gun program for air combat pilot excellence. Its aviators were ready for a new fighter to match their skills. Nearly every aircraft carrier had the honor of being home to a MiG killer. The USS Constellation's air wings were credited with 15 kills. The Bonham Richards wing scored 12 kills, and the Midway's 8 kills. Most MiG kills were by the F-4 Phantom, 
Yet by 1972, the new fighter had just arrived. The original F-4 design dated back to the 1950s. Now they were in need of replacement for fleet defense as MiGs had shown themselves to be near equals in a dogfight. The F-14 was initially developed from concepts worked out in the General Dynamics F-111. But as a long-range air interception missile platform, the Tomcat has no competition. Its used pulse Doppler radar can detect and track numerous MiG aircraft while attacking six of them at the same time with Phoenixes. Just in case of a close-in dogfight, the F-14 also carried Sparrows, Sidewinders, and a 20-millimeter cannon. The Navy was getting a lot of firepower from just one fighter. The Tomcat made itself right at home upon deployment to the Navy's four major fleets. Despite its increased aerial lethality, the F-14 took up no more deck space than the F-4. And despite the Tomcat's structural and electrical complexity, fewer maintenance problems were encountered than some analysts originally feared. But to no one's surprise, the new fighter's biggest fans were its aviators. The U.S. Navy has maintained an active presence in the Mediterranean Sea since the 1800s. Today, the Sixth Fleet patrols its waters. Though the fleet's principal strength is air power, the carriers are supported by cruisers, destroyers, and submarines. Unstable political conditions have made the Sixth Fleet a necessary presence in the Med. Soviet Bear bombers on reconnaissance missions are often escorted by F-14s. The Bear crews no doubt hope this is all they will ever see of the Tomcat. The 1980s saw the Sixth Fleet in action again and again throughout the Mediterranean. More than 20 crises have broken out since 1970. The combat-ready F-14 Tomcats were soon to meet their first real challenge. Colonel Muammar al-Qaddafi became dictator of Libya through a military coup. The Soviet Union has supplied his regime with tanks, air defenses, and other military equipment, including combat aircraft. In 1981, the Sixth Fleet was on maneuvers in the Gulf of Sidra. These international waters were claimed by Colonel Qaddafi as belonging to Libya. Gaddafi said that to sail into his gulf was to cross the line of death. The Navy would not be intimidated by his threat and conducted its maneuvers as scheduled. The Tomcats were prepared for a typical combat air patrol mission. They were armed with a full load of Phoenixes, Sparrows, Sidewinders, and cannon projectiles. No one had any inkling of what was to come later that day. Helped by Soviet radar surveillance, the Libyans took immediate action. Soviet-built Sukhoi Su-22 attack aircraft, similar to these Su-7s, took off from the Al Bumba Air Base. The Sukhois were armed with heat-seeking ATOL missiles.
The Sukhois were of an older design dating back to the 60s. It was almost suicidal for them to attack an F-14. But the determined Libyan pilots wasted no time in their pursuit of the Tomcats. The Sukhois quickly launched their atolls within striking distance. The Tomcat aviators responded to the attacking Sukhois using their razor-sharp flight skills. When news of the dogfight reached the anxious deck crews, everyone wondered if war with Libya would break out. Just what was Gaddafi planning? Would he try to challenge the Navy again? If so, what would he do next? Or when? But for now, Gaddafi was quiet. And besides, the 6th Fleet would soon be supporting its fellow Marine units from offshore of Beirut, Lebanon. President Reagan loved the F-14 Tomcat. Throughout his administration, he deployed naval air power to demonstrate America's presence and commitment to the fight for freedom. President Reagan was so confident in the Navy's abilities that his aides allowed him to sleep undisturbed for six more hours after the Tomcat shot down the Sukhois. His Secretary of Defense, Caspar Weinberger, was in the speedy process of building up a 600-ship Navy. The Tomcat was shining proof of naval aviation's pursuit of excellence. Everything seemed too good to be true. Without warning, an explosion ripped apart an American military discotheque in West Germany. A U.S. airliner was hijacked. Random acts of terrorism against innocent civilians spread across the European continent. Intelligence sources eavesdropping on Libyan radio reported Gaddafi to have ordered the terrorist attacks. The United States was held hostage. A raid was on to bomb Libyan military installations. Air Force FB-111 bombers took off from bases in England and flew thousands of miles en route to Libya. Soviet military air transports parked on a runway near Tripoli were easy to find even after the long flight. The FB-111's infrared television recorded the event. All bombs exploded within striking distance of their targets. A-6 intruders were launched from six fleet carriers for raids on Benghazi. F-14s provided combat air patrol. This time, there were no MiGs to fight. But the intruders had to evade more than 100 surface-to-air missiles to drop their bombs on target. In January 1989, Gaddafi would suddenly strike again. He had received high-tech swing-wing MiG-23 floggers from the Soviets. Unaware of Gaddafi's intentions, F-14 Tomcats were launched as usual for combat air patrol. Gaddafi ordered his floggers to attack the Tomcats. The following is a recording of the actual radio transmission between the Tomcat aviators, the USS John Kennedy, and the E-2 Hawkeye electronic control aircraft, which first detected the approaching MiG-23s. Gypsy 2 0 contact 175-72 miles. Looks like a flight of two, Angels 10. Goes out curves showing 78 miles. Throttle back just a little bit here. Change course. 
Joe now shows 25 miles separation. Turn it down. Contacts uh, appear to be heading uh, 315 mile speed 430, Angels uh, approximately 8,000. Roger, Ace, take it north. Yes, Roger. We're going to have to make a quick loop here. Uh, starboard, uh, I'm going to give you a collision here. Okay, come starboard about 40. Two zero seven, uh, sixty one miles now, bearing one eight zero. Angels eight, heading uh, three three zero. Ready up. Off Bravo is closed out. Come back port uh, twenty degrees here. He's drinking now. At us. Okay, bogies appear to be coming, uh, jinking to the right now, heading uh, north. Speed uh, 430, uh, Angels uh, 5,000 now in the descent. Okay, let's take her down now. We're going down. Sure. Okay. Slows out uh, 53 miles now. Bogies appear to be heading uh, directly at us. I'm coming port. Steady up uh, 150 for 30 degree offset. 50 miles. Nine miles now, speed 450, Angels 9. I'm going down to 3. Crossing back over. Roger. Roger that. 30 degree offset now. Bogey's uh, heading 340, speed 500. Let's accelerate. Okay, they look like they're at the 9,000 okay. feet now. Roger. Bogey's have jinked back into us now. Let's come starboard 30 degrees the other side. Coming to starboard. Angels. Hames joined up, set station. Roger. Angels now 11. Double. Steady up. Close out. Uh, warning yellow. Weapons hold. I repeat. Warning yellow. Weapons hold. Alpha Bravo out. Uh, Roger. Okay. Gypsies. Pass up. Bravo directs. Warning yellow. Weapons hold. 35 miles here. Roger that. Bogies have jinked back into me now for the third time. With noses on at 35 miles. Angels 7. <laughs> Bravo, close out you copy. Okay, I'm taking another Still offset. Safe. Starboard, starboard, uh, 210. Guy got locked up, Leo, 30 miles, and he's a 13,000 piece of trailer. Roger that. Level off here. Okay, bogey's jinked back into me for the fourth time. I'm coming back, starboard. Come back, port now. Port, 27 miles. Bogies at 7,000 feet. 45. Watch that bogies, 135, 50, Angels, 16. Heading 340. Okay. Roger, same bogies. You're in collision now, steering. Okay, bogies have jinked back at me again for the fifth time. They're on my nose now. Inside of 20 miles. Master arm on, master arm on. Okay. Good light. Good light. Okay, centering up the T. Bogey is jinked back into me again. 16 miles at center of the dot. Say your angels. I'm at angels five. Nose up. Oh, his angels. Oh, wait a minute. Angels are at nine. Alpha Bravo from 207. 13 miles. Fox one. Fox one. Oh, Jesus. Right. Roger that. Ten miles. He's back on my nose. Fox one again. Watching him up. Six miles. Six miles. Tally two. Tally two. Turning into me. Roger that. Five miles. Four miles. Okay, he's got a missile off. Breaking right. Okay. Good hit, good hit on one. Roger that. Good kill, good kill. I've got the other one. Select box two, select box two. I got box two. Coming hard, stop. No fucking...
Shoot him. I don't got a tone. Got the second one. I got the second one on the nose right now. Hey, I'm high cover on you. Get a lock, get a lock him up. Lock him up. Bam, shoot him, box two. I can't, I don't have a fucking tone. So what? Good kill, good kill. Hey, good kill. Pilot ejected. Pilot ejected out of the second one. Okay, my sir, let's head north, head north. Okay, port side, high, I'm coming down hard. Roger. Roger that, this is a going north, let's go down low, out of deck, unload, 500 knots, let's get out of here. Wait, two good shoes. You're showing uh, two good shoes in the air here from Munster. Roger that, I see the, uh... I got the splash, one splash. One splash. Take that down to, uh, 3,000 here, Munster. The, uh, splash 160 at 96. Go. Munster down to 3,000. Let's get out of here. Run north on your right side. Roger. The other chute is high up uh, just to the right of the first splash. We got a good chutes on all of them. Roger. Two floggers, two floggers splash. Uh, close out. We're heading north. Okay. There's Munster. He's over on the right side. The F-14 was now a MiG killer and famous worldwide for its mastery of the skies. By waiting until the last possible moment to defend themselves, the Tomcat aviators proved the F-14's superiority over the MiGs in this twisting and turning 500-knot duel. Instead of long-range Phoenixes, the floggers had been killed at short range with Sparrow and Sidewinder missiles. The Tomcat could fight and win in any situation. Unfortunately, the four aviators who flew the two Tomcats will remain officially anonymous. To make their identities known would make themselves and their families potential targets for terrorist reprisals. Unlike the F-14, they will probably never enjoy any public acclaim for their victories. The mental and physical fitness required to fly an aircraft like the F-14 demands a dedication that only a few can commit to. It is a dedication that is greater than the pursuit of money, power, or fame. Few people will ever come to grasp the reasons why anyone possessing such intelligence and coordination would commit his life to being a Navy fighter pilot. Those who do fly, or want to fly for the Navy, will immediately understand. It is simply to be the best. Ever vigilant and always prepared, Tomcat aviators are waiting on call until their services are needed again. If and when the need arises, the F-14 Tomcat and its crew are guaranteed to deliver.